Welcome to the Business Speak Podcast, where we take everything you need to know about being successful in business and make it easy to understand. Whether you're a longtime business owner, newer to this entrepreneur stuff, or hoping to run your own company in the future, you've come to the right place. Featuring your host, professional accountant and business guru, Mr. Chill. So relax and have some fun with us as we journey through business speak, the language of business simplified. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to the Business Speak podcast. I am your host, Mr. Chill. Today, I am joined by a good friend and very smart uh business owner and human resource person named Shelly Tobin. Shelly, go ahead and say hi. Hey, everyone. I'm uh, grateful to have Shelly here. The reason she's here today is because we are going to dive into the topic today of human resources. And more specifically, the title of this episode is called Employees, the Most Valuable Asset a Company Has. And there's some really cool aspects of that we're going to dive into today. Uh, I'm excited to learn along with you from Shelly and her years of expertise. Now you might be thinking, well, what expertise is that? And luckily, I have a really awesome bio to read here that will give you some good insight into who Shelly is and why you should stick around and listen to our episode today. Shelly Tobin is the driving force behind Higher Growth Consulting, a consultancy dedicated to empowering small businesses to excel in recruiting, hiring, and nurturing their most valuable asset, their employees. With a deep-seated passion for ensuring the success and well-being of businesses, Shelley leverages over 25 years of experience in recruitment, management, and entrepreneurship to guide her clients through the complexities of the employee life cycle. Having spent two decades in management roles and as a business owner herself, Shelley intimately understands the challenges and rewards of people management. She recognizes that effective communication, understanding individual motivations, and fostering a supportive work environment are paramount to business success. Leveraging tools such as DISC assessments, Shelley helps businesses gain invaluable insight into their team dynamics, communication styles, and motivational factors, enabling them to optimize employee performance and satisfaction. I'm going off script here a bit, but Shelly also has a pretty fun life outside of her expertise in human resources. Uh, beyond her professional endeavors, Shelly's a devoted wife and mother, finding joy in exploring the world with her husband and their two children. She's an enthusiastic supporter of her children's athletic pursuits, often found cheering them on from the sidelines. And as a side note, just because I know this, there's a pun there. I don't know if it's intended, but uh, at least one of her kids is pretty into cheerleading and cheer squad and stuff. So there's a very double meaning behind cheering them on. Additionally, Shelly shares her home with three rescue dogs, embodying her compassionate nature both in and out of the workplace. With a relentless commitment to helping businesses thrive and a genuine passion for supporting her community, Shelly Tobin continues to make a meaningful impact through her work at Higher Growth Consulting. Well, that's quite the... That's quite the resume of uh, credentials there. I'm excited to have you here. One of the things, I actually highlighted a few things in the uh, bio here because I was curious to dive into them. Many of them already will provide some really good questions and topics we can dive into. One that has absolutely nothing to do with what we're talking about, but I think will help people get to know how, kind of a little bit more about your personality. Talk more about these rescue dogs. Oh, fun. Well, I mean, we've had dogs forever. And um, after our first two were gone, we decided we wanted to go into the world of rescue. And our first dog um, was a rescue from Mexico. Um, They flew him up here and we took him in. And then a few years later, we decided that he needed a a friend to hang out with during the day. And so we found uh, another rescue dog down in Lacombe and brought him home, but uh, he had a brother. And uh, my kids told my husband that, and I ended up going back to Lacombe the next day to get the brother. So now I have three of them. Wow, and how do your kids feel about the dogs? 
uh, well, I mean, they love the dogs. They're, they're, it took a while, right, for them, especially the two most recent ones, to get used to us because they were in an abusive situation. And so it's, you know, a challenge. It's still a challenge six years later with them. The first dog was a puppy when we got him. So we had a little bit more success in training him. Wasn't quite so many um, bad habits in him yet. So. Fair enough. Now, I, I said that that had nothing to do with our topic, but it may be an interesting application kind of way. You take three pets who have their own personalities and their own life experiences, not always good, not always positive, and you bring them into a family environment and try to make that family environment and dynamic work. I'm sure that creates all kinds of interesting experiences and challenges and stuff that probably to, relates a lot to bringing in an employee from a their own set of life perspectives and challenges and trying to figure out how to make them fit well into a family, if you will, of a corporation or a small business environment. So there might actually be some tie in there. There probably is. I mean, it really is. Um, you take a chance every time you bring a new person into your work environment and and wondering whether or not they're going to fit uh, with what's already there. And, and there are ways to try and help uh, achieve a greater fit than just, you know, a gut feeling, so. And as I'm sure you'll bring up a couple times during our time together, gut feelings have a really good place and they also have probably a real dangerous place. They do. They can get us into trouble more often than we would like. So, I mean, you have to listen to your gut. There's there's something there, there for a reason, but it shouldn't be the only thing that we take into some of these decisions we make in our businesses. Cool. Well, I'm excited to dive into this. One more question uh, before we dive into the material specifically. I know your bio talks a lot about what you've done and the things you've accomplished. I think our listeners might be interested to know why this is so passionate for you. Why is this something that is just something that you thrive and enjoy uh, being a part of? You know, I, I go back to my restaurant management days and, and what I really loved about my job back then was was the interviewing, was the managing the people, the training, the scheduling, that kind of stuff. What I didn't really like towards the end of it was the, the customers that I was dealing with, right? And so going to school, figuring out that that's what I wanted, and then going to school. And while I was in school, um, and this is a while ago, but while I was in school, I, I learned all about the legal aspects of HR, and quickly realized that the employees are protected by the government. With all the legislation that's out there, the government does a really good job of protecting them. But what a lot of small businesses don't understand and, and don't know, because we don't know what we don't know, um, is that there are things that they can do to protect themselves. And it was then that I really realized I wanted to work with small businesses to help them find success but protect those assets that they've put in their their financial investment and and their emotional investment. I mean, this is their baby. It's just like a child and and you want to protect that and you want to make sure it has a chance to succeed. And when you bring employees in, you bring you add a whole other dynamic to how the workplace has to run and how how can you be successful in that? And not play favoritism and not, you know, just not um, treat people differently, right? Because when you do that, then you start to run into problems. Yeah. So, Cool. Well, thank you. Thank you for that background. I think that'll help. Now, as I said, there's some things in your bio that I think could be sort of mini topics here on their own, but you're the subject matter expert, not me in this regard. So where do you want to start? Where would be a good place to start with the people listening as to get them to towards like a key concept that you want to make sure they take away from this? Well, I think it's really important to understand, um, you know, when and why you need an employee. I mean, if you're a solopreneur, if you're a tradesperson out on your own, a contractor doing just odd jobs by yourself, and there comes a point in your life where you decide, well, I can't do this by myself all the time, right? And and how do I how do I do this? How do I grow a business? What do I need to do? What do I need to know? And I think that's the point where most people start um, to start to realize, start to think about the possibility 
the opportunity that's out there for them. And that then boils down to, well, okay, how do I do this? Right. And we have when we start a business, most people know that they need to see a lawyer and get papers and stuff drafted. And and they all almost everyone knows they need to come and see someone like you as an accountant to get their taxes done. They should know. Not as many know as I (laughs) wish. And I don't even just mean me, but just seeking a professional to help. I wish more people started there. But it is I do appreciate when people have that foresight. Right. And so HR is is one of those kind of lost professions that people just either don't know that it exists or don't realize that there is that kind of support out there. And so when we're when we're starting to build a business, that's the ideal time to start looking at the things you need to do to have that success immediately with employees, right? And so there's lots of things that you can do to start that process, but really the first thing to do is to decide what it is you want. And a lot of people will struggle, and, and you know, we, we kind of alluded to that in, in our prep for this, but a lot of people will struggle with the fact that, well, I don't, I don't want anyone to do this. No one can do it as good as me. But the reality of the situation is, is that as a business owner, you're not just doing the thing you love to do. You're doing all the other business stuff. Maybe you're the bookkeeper. Maybe if you have an office, you're the, mm-hmm. the, the cleaner. Maybe you're doing marketing. Maybe you're doing reception. And, you know, you're, you're taking on all of these other roles. And if you're a tradesperson, maybe you're booking appointments and you're, you're dealing with invoicing after hours. And what does that do? It takes away from your family life. It takes away from your work-life balance, which at the end of the day is really what we're all looking for, right? We're looking to have that balance but be successful. And so I always talk to employers, especially solopreneurs, about, okay, well, let's, let's take away the things that you like to do because you're going to continue to do those. You don't want to give those up. Not yet, right? Especially if you're a very small company. You don't want to give that up yet. But what you do want to give up is those things that are taking you away from what's making the money, mm-hmm. right? The things that someone else can do and can probably do better and faster than you can. Right. And so, you know, it, I talk about I talk about this a lot in my previous business. Um, I did everything right. Yeah, sure. I had employees, but I still did all the bookkeeping. I did all the marketing. I did. I cleaned the office. I was recruiting and hiring people for other companies. And and at the end of the day, it was just too much. And two and a half years into doing this, I thought, OK, well, you know, what is it going to cost me to do this, to have someone else do this? And I contacted a cleaning company and I found out, well, that's only $250 a month. Well, my time's worth more than $250 (laughs) a month, right? I'm in the office for four or five hours a week cleaning. Now, okay, let's get rid of that, right? And then I hired a part-time bookkeeper that came in once a week and did all the bookkeeping I needed done. And that was fantastic. And then I hired a part-time employee who was reception, but she had a marketing background. And so all of a sudden, here I was getting all the social media help I needed. And I, you know, I looked at all of the areas that I was doing that I really didn't love, but was doing because I had to, Mm -hmm. and realized that by farming all of that out, I was spending more time on the things that really mattered. And I doubled my revenue the next year. Probably also your enjoyment of your job. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I'm sorry, I'm not a bookkeeper. I don't (laughs) want to do bookkeeping. And it is the last thing on my list. And I will postpone it and procrastinate as often as I can to get that done. Thank you. You're in good company there. I'm sure I am. I'm sure there's lots of people that are just not that good with it. And at the end of the day, I realized that the five to six hours that I was spending doing something, someone else could do in two. So am I really saving money here? And so we look at that as a solopreneur and an entrepreneur and say, okay, well, what can I give away? What can I delegate to someone else to do so that I can still enjoy what I'm doing and grow the company? So that's an interesting thought. Like coming into here today, even just preparing for this podcast, I was thinking to myself, well, what you said earlier, you know, the typical person I'll meet with, you'd be like, well, I, I'm too busy to to run my business by myself, I know I probably need to hire someone, but the no one's going to be able to do this key core job I do as well as I do. Ironically, I'd never actually considered the idea of 
keeping the parts that the owner likes and outsourcing, if you will, the other pieces. And whether that outsourcing is a literal third party contractor or an employee who can take those on. And that there that way the person who started the business who feels that, you know what, I've had a reputation and no one else can be able to do it quite as good as I can, they can still maintain control over those key core pieces. And they can for a while. For a while. Right? There will come a time where they can't do that anymore and the 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 passion has to change slightly to be growing the business and doing the things that help to grow that business or drive the growth of the business. So, but initially, when you're first starting to look at it and, and thinking about the fact that you don't have time to spend with your kids or to go on a vacation or even just relax for a weekend at the lake, because you're always working, that's when you have to start thinking about where do I want this business to go and what do I want it to look like? And if it's employees, that's also the time to start looking at contacting someone who understands what that is and getting an idea, at least getting an idea of what it is you need to know to be successful in having employees. Okay. So let's sort of dive into this one layer deeper. Mm -hmm. So let's assume that a lot of the people listening are the solo entrepreneur version of what you said. Mm -hmm. And so they might just be themselves or just them and a significant other or them and a buddy or something. And they're ready to hire, but they're not quite ready to give up the key parts of the business, but they would buy into that concept because it makes a lot of sense of, well, let's take the pieces I don't like anyways that are going to take me three times as long as someone who loves it and has an efficiency about it, and parse those out. How do we make the decision as to whether we should parse those out to somebody that we hire on as an employee versus someone we sort of outsource fully as a subcontractor concept? Like, can you speak to that? What would you say? Absolutely. So the first thing that I would do is I would tell them to, let's make a list. Let's make a list of what you've got here. And then tell me how long does it take you to do it? And now how long do we think it would take someone who knows what they're doing to do it, okay? Once we have that figured out, we can really determine whether or not the company is at a point of hiring an employee or outsourcing it. Because if you hire an employee, you're guaranteeing that person so many hours of work per week. But if you don't have that many hours of work per week, then you're paying someone to do nothing, right? So if you have 10 hours of work per week, um, you know, the chances of finding someone who wants 10 hours of work per week as a part-time employee are going to be pretty slim, right? It's just not something people are looking for. So then we look at what other options do we have there? Well, in a lot of cases, because most of the clients I deal with are in that trade sphere, um, we're looking at delegating admin and accounting and customer service type functions. Well, then we look at going to possibly virtual assistants, okay? People who represent your company and you're paying them for, you know, 10 hours a week or you're paying them for five hours a week and then maybe you're paying a little bit of a premium if you go an extra hour over a week, right? But you're not committed to uh, a specific, like the 20 hours, you can cut it down and, and move it around a little bit until you're ready to bring someone in for 20 to 25 or 30 hours a week. So it would be a combination of the number of hours you expect and the consistency of those hours? Right. Okay. Right. Because when you have an employee, they want consistent work. That's what they're there for. Right. They want to know that they've got so many hours per week and that they're going to make so much money per week. But when you take that and you you farm it out to a virtual assistant, a company or an individual, whoever that may be, then you've got a little bit more flexibility in the number of hours that you can use. Yes, you usually have to sign a contract for a specific number of hours that you and the company decide on, but you do also have the ability to increase that. You know, if you're coming up to a really busy time in the season, well, maybe you increase it to 15 hours a week. And then you slow down and you bring it back down to 10, right? There's a little bit more flexibility that way, right? Okay. When, when you get to a consistent amount of hours, and, and a virtual assistant will tell you this, if they're good at what they're doing, they may say, okay, look, your needs are surpassing what we can provide you now because virtual assistants are typically for those part-time roles, right? Very part-time roles. So then 
they may say, okay, it might be time for you to consider hiring someone, right? Because the consistency of hours and the per week is regular. So that, at that point, it, there would be a financial savings probably by bringing someone in-house. But Absolutely. there's also other things too. Like, let me give you an example. So like even preparing for launching this podcast over the last couple of months, I seriously looked at outsourcing the marketing side because it's definitely not my forte. Um, and so when it came to outsourcing, I had two options. I could find a company whose specialization was marketing or I could take a chance on hiring somebody. There was the consistent work. And so I had this kind of dilemma in my head. On the one hand, a company who has been doing this for years and has top ratings and whatever, I'm like, there's probably some really cool stuff they could do. But somewhere I think deep in the back of my mind was this thought that if you outsource to a third party, they're never gonna be quite as buy-in, quite as passionate, quite as, I'm all in kind of concept as someone who worked for you and that's all they did. And so I struggled with this and then at the end of the day, I don't know if I made the right call or wrong call, but I decided to hire an employee who works on this full time, even if it cost me a little bit more because I wanted someone who was all in, uh, like m emotionally invested in what we were doing, not distracted by 19 other projects that are all sort of going on at the same time. Right. Not looking for a right or wrong here, but that was a dilemma that I had. And there is no right or wrong. It's it's what works best for that business owner, right? Um, so your dilemma is the dilemma that everyone has in whatever it is that they're hiring for, right? It's going to be the same thing, especially in something that's new to a business, whether it's your first employee or your eighth employee, but it's a new aspect to the business. There's always that possibility of the outsourced or the employee and actually to be honest initially if it's a part-time role it's probably going to cost you a little bit more to outsource it than it is or to hire a contractor someone who has their own business that and they give they commit to giving you 10 hours a week and they invoice you for it um, it might cost you a little bit more that way because you're not paying and you'll know this better than me, all of the employment taxes that are involved, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so it really boils down to taking a hard look at the pros and cons of each side of it and where you are in your business right now as to what that looks like. What's the best option for you? Okay. Now, we talked a little bit a few minutes ago. You, meant, you brought up the concept of finding balance. And if you're finding that you as a solopreneur or just with one or two employees or feeling like you are you can't take a weekend off or a day off or whatever, that it's probably time to hire someone. The timing of that's good because our last episode, we brought on a life coach, Brent, who sort of talked us through that whole concept of like work-life balance. And so this is really one additional aspect of it we didn't talk about in that episode, which is that's probably a good sign that it's time to time to bring someone on in some capacity. And that, that's a way to help remedy that, to help provide that. It is, but it's not just for the employer. Because one of the things, and, and this might be getting a bit further ahead than where I want to be, but it's relevant is that you also, when you have employees, you also need to look at your employees' life-work balance, right? Because if they're overworked and they're putting in tons of overtime, that is also a sign that maybe it's time to hire someone new. Overtime costs more, right? Mm -hmm. You're paying more money to have those people there for longer than eight hours in a day. So, you know, if maybe it's a part-time person, but it's a, it's a good thing to pay attention to because it's, it's going to open your eyes to what's actually happening in the business and help you to decide what the next step is. Right? Yeah, you're going to have to do some soul searching. Can I really afford to pay someone else? Um, you're going to have a transition time where there may be some overtime and training and, and there may not be, the, the new individuals may not be as up um, on their skills as you might want, but it's, it's always, you always have to come back to where am I going, what does that look like, and am I in a financial position to do this, right? Because once you hire an employee, you're committed to them the last thing you want to do is start laying people off. 
It's de- demoralizing among many other things. Mm-hmm. And it's really hard. I mean, it's it's hard for the employer. It's hard for the employee. But it also um, puts the company in a bad light, right? Like it changes your employer brand because especially if you're laying off more than one at a time, um, people talk and people don't want to go work for a company where they may not feel like it's stable enough for them to have long-term employment, right? So you really want to look at the big picture. Take that 50,000 foot view of what's going on in the business and make sure you're ready to commit to that. And if you're not ready, what are you going to do to get ready, right? So I can potentially see, and this probably dies into slightly off-topic topics, but I can potentially see someone thinking to themselves or listening to this thinking, okay, I buy what you're selling, Shelly. I, I get it. I don't have the time or capacity to step aside and take that 50,000-foot view. How do you... Does that create a chicken and egg problem? It does. It really does. Because it's the same, it's the same in, in so many aspects of our business, right? What do I do first? And... and you know, I had this conversation with a client today um, as to where they were and what they were doing and, and what they needed to do. And they're so busy right now that they just can't figure out how they're going to get to do the couple of things that I need them to do so that I can be successful in helping them. Because I can't do it by myself. I need to know what's going on. I need to understand the dynamics, what's happening in the business right now so that I can help find the solutions that are needed. And so I I just, I kind of said, look, you're going to have to take a little bit of time and help me out here. Otherwise, we're just going to keep doing this over and over again. And if you want to keep paying me to do this, well, okay, fine. (laughs) But I'd rather see you have success. I'd rather you be happy with the end result than having to keep coming back and doing this again. Kind of. I don't think I've gone an episode yet without quoting from his book, but it kind of reminds me of Stephen Covey's concept of sharpening the saw. Mm-hmm. It's like, I don't have time to go sharpen the saw. I just got to cut, 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 cut. And it's like, and then it gets you're dull with a pretty and dull, cut. dull thing, but it's, <laughs> it's what you know how to do. Exactly. So again, let's sort of recap then. When I asked you a bit ago, okay, if, if you could only get like one key concept, a main key concept across to the people listening to this, what would it be? We've talked about your solopreneurs. We've talked about hiring and how you kind of might know when it's time and some strategies you could look at and knowing you know whether they're going to outsource that and what kind of things to parse out versus what kind of things to hold on to so let's take it that one step further what if it's what if it isn't just the things they don't want to do that need to be outsourced what if they're growing to the point where they need someone else that can do the main bread and butter activity of that company the thing that is sort of their passion project Mm -hmm. how do you how do you get to the point where you're comfortable letting go enough to let somebody else help you do that core business? I mean, I think it's a lot of self-reflection about why did you go into business? Why did you want to do this? What was the end goal? Because if the end goal is just you on the tools or at a desk doing everything all the time by yourself, well, then you've achieved that goal. But if the goal is to have more freedom and to have to build something that can be passed on from, from one generation to the next or or sold or whatever, well, what do you need to do to get there? And, and it may be irrelevant as to what I like to do. Now it's it's going to get to the point where it's what do I need to do? Right? What do I as a business owner need to be able to hand off and that, yeah, it might be the thing you love the most about the work that you're doing. But as you mentioned before, okay, there's only one person that's truly invested in the business. Maybe two if there's, to- if there's partners. Those are the two people that are truly invested in what's going on with the business. And so you can't hand off the management of the business so that you can stay on the tools. Mm-hmm. It just doesn't work that way, right? Because now they're building your business for you and they're gonna take it in a direction that maybe you don't want it to go, right? So it really comes back to understanding what your goals were when you decided to start the business as to where you need to go next. And if that is next, you managing and someone else doing the work you love to do, then that's what it needs to be. In some cases, you know, especially for those in the trades, it comes down to um, 
it comes down to their ability to to continue to do it. And, and a lot of my clients that I deal with have young children, you know, two to two to twelve years old, and they start to realize that they're missing out on things that are happening in their lives and they want to make that change, right? I'm sure that this is not new to anyone, right? I mean, it's the same as an employee. If you're overworked, you want your family life. um, And so you start to look at changes and you decide as an employee that you need to make that change and you're going to go and find a different job. Well, as a business owner, we can't go find that different job. That job's there waiting for us right? You just have to take the jump to do it. And the passion then changes, maybe just a little bit. Yeah, maybe you can go out and supervise some jobs or help out if there's someone sick for a day or something like that. But the passion then changes to what you you work, because your needs change, right? You don't need to be on the tools anymore. You need to grow the business so that you can have that family time or the trip that you wanted to do, or whatever it may be, whatever the new goals are. But it, it just, it comes down to, there is no one that's gonna, that's gonna drive this business more than the person who started it. Okay, so that reminds me of something else I wanna ask you then. The title of this episode, and I think it was mentioned in your bio I read too, talks about the employee being the most valuable asset of a company. Right. When I get to a point or if I'm a business owner, I get to the point where I need to start hiring someone else to do my key core business model. And therefore, you know, they're going out to meet with clients and or they're producing some of the work I'm selling and my reputation's on the line. It might be tempting to see that person as more of a liability than an asset. How, how do I manage my own inner thoughts when I'm bringing someone in and I just, I'm always stressed and worried about what wrong move they're going to make as opposed to the actually seeing them as that valuable asset we talk about. I think I might surprise you with this answer. I'm ready to be surprised. (laughs) Um, It really comes down to hiring based on your core values. Because if you can hire someone who understands and lives your core values, then they're going to represent you the same way. Hmm. Okay. I was not expecting the answer to be that sort of straightforward. But it is. So then again, that requires someone to sit down and figure out what their core values are. Absolutely. But one of the things that employees are looking for these days is an alignment with their core values and the company core values. So you really should have them anyways. Again, we'll get into should versus do. (laughs) I mean, I would be lying if I said every new client that comes to our firm has got a proper minute book and has crossed through the proper hoops of doing what they should have done. Mm -hmm. Um, I'd be guilty. And a lot of them, too, might even accidentally find themselves running a corporation because well, this kind of dives into something else, but they maybe not really wanted to go into business for themselves. They wanted an employment job, but they went to go work for company X that said, I'm not hiring you, but I'll bring you on as a contractor. Right. And so now they find themselves in business, even though they really just wanted to be an employee of this company and just make a one person living. Mm-hmm. So they may not have ever sat down to try and think about core values because it was really, as you said earlier, may never been their goal to be more than just a one-person show. And, you know, but at the end of the day, we do still have core values, right? Even if it's just mirroring our own core values as an individual and a person, we still have core values that as we build and grow our companies, we want to show, right? And so part of my process is I ask clients, you know, do we have core values to work with? And if we do, what are they? And how do you see that, envision that in your business, in the employees, um, so that we can look for that? And there are questions that we can ask on all sorts of things that help us see what their core values are as an individual. Some of the resources and tools that you have at Mm -hmm. your disposal to help with that. Yeah. And so that allows us to look for individuals that we know will do business in the same fashion that we do it ourselves. So they become kind of an extension of us. Mm-hmm. Right. And then that liability constant worrying on your shoulder thing and hopefully is mitigated in some fashion, hopefully. Well, I, th- I think it's always going to be there. I think you're always going to be worried as a business owner if everyone is 
is doing things the way that you would want them to be done. And and yes, there are going to be missteps and there are going to be people who maybe don't understand or miss something. And it's how we deal with it that allows us to build the culture in the organization that people want to work for. Okay. So I'm going to go back to this first concept again, mm-hmm. but I want to kind of take a different focus on it. So again, We've talked about employees being the most valuable asset. And so yes. far, what we've focused on is how we can view them as an asset. Right. We haven't really talked about how they can be the most valuable asset. And I can think of a lot of assets that a company could have. And they might have hundreds of thousands of dollars in a bank account. They might have some negative investments. They might have some uh, branding or some um, other things that they've spent a lifetime of sweat equity building. How... How is it that an employee should be seen? Why is it that an employee should be seen as the most valuable asset? Above all of those things, how can an employee be the most valuable asset? And I think we've kind of skirted around this a little bit in in previous answers. Yes, a new employee will bring um, new perspectives, different skills um, to a company. But at the end of the day, what makes them the most valuable is they're the people that are dealing with the customers. And so if they buy into you and your company and your company values and they represent you that way, then your customers will continue to grow because they like the way they're being treated. If you treat your employees badly, then your employees are going to treat your customers the same way, right? And, and so they become more and more valuable the more we have. Um, I'm, I guess maybe not even just the more that we have, but even that first employee that we hire, um, because they're dealing with your customers and they're representing you. And so as the business grows, that becomes how people expect the business to operate. And that in turn leads to pos- possibly referrals or... Um, other aspects that grow the business. And so really at the end of the day, these are the people that are going to help you build the processes that make you successful, that are going to um, allow you to grow properly and, and give your clients the service that they need for you to be successful. And that's what makes them valuable because you can have all the processes and everything in, in place you could have all of them, like you could have a hundred different processes in place, but at the end of the day, it's the people that are going to make or break the business. Mm-hmm. Okay. I feel like you quoted right from some of the quotes I thought were really cool that I found. Stephen Covey says this, always treat your employees exactly as you want them to treat your best customers. Sure. I like Absolutely. That there's, there's, I've got so many quotes that I love that are HR related as well. And, and one of the ones that I, I actually even have this um, on almost everything I do. And so this is my favorite quote because it's, um, it's from Walt Disney. And he mm-hmm. says, you can dream, create, design, and build the most wonderful place in the world, but it requires people to make the dream a reality. And if you don't have the people and you don't treat them right, then you're not going to build that dream. Well, I think it's neat and appropriate that you picked a Walt Disney quote to share with me. <laughs> you know me a little bit. I'm a bit of a little kid at heart, I guess. This quote's on my website. It's been there for a long time. <laughs> so it is my favorite quote. <laughs> well, so you talked about, I mean, you talked about this. So let's dive into this aspect a little bit. Um, how do we create an environment, um, a culture, if you will, uh, but you can take whatever aspect that you want where employees want to work. Like if people are such a key to making my business thrive and grow and be an never like an ever growing extension of me, how do I make that work environment a place where they want to be? Especially if maybe I operate in an industry, if I'm listening out there, maybe our, we own a vac truck and our job is going around sucking people's septic tanks or whatever, like picture whatever you think might be the worst job in the world. How do you still create an environment, even in a hard job, even in a boring industry, whatever, that people want to be at, that people want to work at? You know, I mean, it it always ends up, for me, coming back to the culture of the organization. And, of course, the first part of that we've already talked about, which is the core values. But 
it also comes back to what do the employees want or need to be successful. And, and over the years, that's a moving target, right? Because it depends on the people that are in the organization. Some people may want to have flex time. Some people may want to work remote or hybrid. Um, and that's more common now than it has ever been. Some people may want to know that the company is mindful of their uh, mental health. Um, others may want um, to know that their managers or their leaders in the organization care about them as a person, not just a professional, right? So it could be something as simple as the owner of the company or the CEO of a company walking into a room and, and taking five minutes to talk to a few people, right? The, the needs of the individual employees are going to vary greatly, and it takes effort by all owners, managers, everyone in the business to make sure that those needs are met because what motivates one person doesn't necessarily motivate another. Starting to remind me of why parenting seems like such a hard, daunting well, it task. Is. It's, it's no different. Every, every kid in our family is different. They want something different. Maybe, you know, you have one kid that just wants to spend time with you and you have another kid who just wants to go out and do the things that they love to do. And, and so you have to adjust the way you deal with it. It's no different with employees. Everyone is going to be different. You're going to have those highly competitive people that are out for money and they want that big bonus or commission check, right? But you're also going to have those people that might prefer to have a day off with pay to go and work at a local charity or not-for-profit. Um, so understanding your people and what they need to be successful, to be motivated, to want to be there is what's going to help you. Um, and that's a conversation, right? You can, you can do that just by having conversations with people. Is it as simple as asking someone in a hiring interview what motivates you? Like, can sure, you ask but that I don't, directly, Hannah? Yeah, but I don't think you're going to get the answer you're no. looking for in so an interview. How do you find that information? Right? That's something that comes after the fact. That comes as you build the relationship with the employee and understanding them more. I mean, if you have a sales position and you're hiring for um, a, a commission sales, you know they want the money. That's why they're there. They're highly competitive people. And if you don't hire a competitive person, you've probably got the wrong person in the job, right? So you look at other things, right? If you're, you're talking to an administrative assistant that really doesn't affect the bottom line that much in directly, anyways, indirectly they always do, but directly they don't affect it. So commission's not as important to them, right? So like I said, each person is going to be different, and it's just having a conversation. What do you like to do? Now, don't do this when you're interviewing, okay? <laughs> okay. Uh, yes, I don't you know can what ask... she's about to say, but maybe, like, take special note. <laughs> you can ask about what their hobbies are but in an interview, but you can't ask um, the personal questions, right? So, for example, um, you, you can't touch on religion in an interview, Okay, um, that can get you into so much trouble, and that's a whole other topic of conversation. <laughs> but when you're building that relationship with an employee, not an applicant or a candidate, with an employee, you can start to have those conversations. What do you like to do on the weekends? What, you know, what you might find that they're looking at, or they like to go and volunteer with Habitat for Humanity and, and help build houses or um, go to the soup kitchen or the food bank or whatever. And maybe that then becomes a, a way for you to help them achieve their personal core values because obviously that's part of their personal core values to give them that opportunity during work, right? Maybe it's the whole company takes an afternoon off and goes to the food bank. Sure, your competitive people are going to absolutely hate that, but they'll do it, right? Or you know, there's just so many different ways to look at it. It's not a one question solves and gives you all the answers. It really is building the relationships with mm -hmm. the employees. It's not seeing them as a number and as a means to an end. It's seeing them as a person and understanding what makes them tick. Right? What makes them get up in the morning? Because that's what's going to make them be, feel 
better about coming to work, if they can feel like the company values their, what they value. So what you just said speaks to me, and that's that's what I try to do. But what if my company gets to the point, or anyone that's not there is in a company already that's big enough that it seems unscalable in my momentary understanding here to, how do you scale that? How do I, how do I, as a business owner, even as a, if I decide to hire an HR person or outsource it, how do I track what 25 people each individually find motivating? And I, I might need to craft a compensation plan and a strategy that really speaks to what is important to that person, which might be completely different than what's important to that person. How do you scale that? It's, it's, it then becomes not about one individual person, but it becomes about a commonality, right? Because there's going to be things that are common between groups of people. Okay. So it's, it then becomes not specifically this cause that you are invested in or, you know, this competition for extra money because that's what you want. Maybe it becomes something that's, available to all employees, but not required. But if you want to do this, you can, right? It allows them the opportunity to fulfill that need because if they can't fulfill it at work, they need to fulfill it outside of work, right? Because that's who they are. And so you want to give them at least a little bit of an opportunity to do that at work. Or it could just simply be that the company then starts to contribute to the organizations. Maybe in that employee's name. Maybe you have an employee of the month contest or something like that, and that employee gets to decide what happens with a chunk of money. Maybe that becomes a competition of some sort. Maybe that becomes a donation to a non not-for-profit or a charity organization. Or maybe it's a silent auction item for a, a, a different group. But allowing them to make those choices, right? Because then they feel like they're part of the organization and they're part of the decision making in a sense, right? They feel like you understand them and value them, right? It comes back to valuing them as a person, not just the profession that they hold or the job that they do or the number that they are in the organization, <laughs> right? Because that's when you start to lose employee engagement when you have a large, larger company, when they start to feel like they're just a number. Okay. Because if they're working for a small business, they're there for a reason because they feel like they can have more of that company culture they're looking for. Okay. So we've talked a bit about how you might know when you need to hire. We've talked a bit about how to make sure the people are, uh, well, a little bit at least, about how to make sure they're a good fit, that the core values are aligned. We talked a little bit about how to provide an environment where they want to stay, so not minimize turnover and just create a good working morale. How do you find good employees? <laughs> or is that where the magic Shelley Tobins of the world come into play? You know, it's, it's difficult in almost every industry right now. Um, and again, that's a bigger topic that would need a whole other hour just to go we'll through. We'll bring it back on a different episode <laughs> and we'll dive into that then. But high level, but, take five minutes. But high minutes level, time. what we need to do is, is you need to stay true to the job. Okay. And what I mean by that is that so many people look at this as, oh, it's so easy to hire someone. I'm just going to throw a job description up on whatever job board I want. I'm going to interview people and I'm going to hire the person I like the best. Like being the wrong word. Because that might just be like a personality connection. It is a personality isn't the connection. the best hiring strategy. No, no, it isn't. Because most times, especially for small businesses that don't have a process in place to hire properly, they sit down and they have a conversation with an individual and they may think it's an interview, but mostly it's a conversation. And they, they finish all the interviews and they say, who did I like the best? Who do I think would work, would fit here the best? And they hire that person and that person doesn't have remotely close to the right skills for the job. And so when I say you need to be true to the job, you need to stay true to the job. The job description that you have defines exactly or should 
define exactly what you're looking for in the position. And so by asking targeted questions in a structured interview, um, it allows you to compare apples to apples and oranges to oranges when you're finally making that, that decision. And so um, it, I say put the blinders on. And I don't usually say put the blinders <laughs> on, but in hiring, we put the blinders on. We have a job description. We are laser focused on that job description. And that allows us to find the person with the right skills. So maybe we have three or four people that have the right skills and you've identified that and any one of them could do that job. Then you can go back and say, who would I like to work with? Because at the end of the day, you're hiring them to take on the skills that are needed in the business to help the business move forward, whether that's to take something off of the owner's plate um, or to take something off of employees plates because they're overworked. There is a reason for that position. Right. And so finding that right person really boils down to having a good job description and a strong hiring process to guide you through it so that you're not following your gut. You're not making mistakes in the interviews and you're comparing apples to apples. Some good advice. So let's take this one in a slightly different direction. But I've dealt with this in my own uh, practice, and I'm sure that I'm not alone in this. You're reaching out to family and friends and saying, who do you know that you know might be a good fit for what I'm looking for? And it turns out they think it's them. And you know, you're, oh, do I hire my spouse to come work with me? Do I hire my kids because it's convenient? And of course they're gonna do things similar to I would. They raised up in the same house. Or my best buddy stirs me, he's the best fit for my job and I've always wanted to work together. That's, is that where that blinders concept comes into play where we gotta look at the skill set first? Like would you ever, I mean, there's too many questions, but like, would you ever recommend hiring family and friends? Is that a slippery slope? It is, and I've done it, and I've regretted it. Okay. Not family, friends. Um, and the reason why I've regretted it is because it really felt after a while that the whole goal was for them to do what they wanted, and I felt taken advantage of. And mm. then it becomes really hard to deal with that situation. Awkward. Awkward, absolutely. It becomes a very challenging situation to get through. And so what I tell people and, and, and businesses that I work with is if you know someone who wants to be considered for the position, have them submit their resume. They're going to go through the process just like every other person that has applied for the position. And I always tell my clients, look, you're going to interview this person regardless because they were a referral but I will give you my opinion as to where they fall in the list of the best candidates available for the job. At the end of the day, you still have to make that decision, but I have given you a way out if that's what they want because they can always use me as that out. Well, and getting to that point, I guess, I feel like it'd be very hard for a business owner to be completely unbiased when it comes to assessing if their best buddy, whether significant other truly has the skill set for the job or if there's well I'm sure if I love them enough or like yep. th having a, an objective third party to come in and make that assessment is probably a wise idea in situations like that. Specific. It is it's not always feasible right um, there may be companies that they financially can't manage to do that right now and I come back to having a hiring process in place that allows you to take the emotion and the bias out of it, right? Because the questions you ask in the interview, if it's, if it's done properly, will tell you who the best person for the job is based on their answers. Okay, so I'm not gonna ask you to give away any Shelley Tobin trade secrets, <laughs> but could you even just give a two or three list starting of these are like the most important questions you should ask in a potential, like a job interview or a, when you're looking at candidates, like don't, like, don't give away all your secret sauce, but mm -hmm. point us in the right direction. So a, a structured interview should always have the typical questions. Where have you most recently worked? What were you doing there? You know, list your job tasks. What did you like about it? What didn't you like about it? And so on. Why are you leaving? Why did you leave? And so on. You should always have those. What makes an interview process better is having 
the behavioral or motivational questions that align with the job description and the skills that are required. So if, and I'm not talking about the physical, so if we're talking about a bookkeeper position, their actual process in, in putting in a journal entry or something like that, I'm talking about the the soft skills that are needed to do that. So let's say we're looking for um, an editor, okay? And so we need someone who has strong attention to detail. They have a good command of the English language. Um, we're looking for very specific skills. And so when you're, when you're crafting your, your interview questions, you're looking for questions that are gonna do that. And a behavioral interview um, allows you the ability to do that. And, and I tell people this all the time, the person that talks the most in the interview loses. And that loser should not be the owner. You ask the question and you shut your mouth and you let them talk. And even if it takes them 30 seconds to talk, they will talk, right? But the point is, is that you're asking these same questions of every person. And I mean, it could be any question. You, there's literally thousands of behavioral and motivational questions out there that you can choose. Um, and so you pick the ones that align with those soft skills that you're needing, customer service, maybe it's problem solving, whatever those are. You pick the one that makes the most sense to you and then you ask that same question of each person so you can go back and look at their answers. You can go back and look at how they would deal with that situation or how they dealt with that situation because behavioral questions refer to a specific Tell me about a situation. Time tell you... me about a time or tell me about a situation in which you had to do this or whatever. So you get to see what the past behavior is because that's the best predictor for future behavior. Hmm. Right? So I can't, I mean, I could give you a, a whole pile of behavioral motiv motivational interview questions, but that's not the point of it. It really is choosing the ones that make the sense, make the best sense for the job. Um, you don't want to ask a question about attention to detail if that's not a part of what they're doing, if it's not required, right? I don't know many jobs that don't require attention to detail, but, um, you know, so, so it, it really boils down to that. And when you ask the same question, when you go back and you can look at the answers and you can say, which one answered in a way that makes the most sense to me? And tip, okay, this is, this is a big tip for anyone who's interested. If you're going to ask a behavioral or a motivational type question, answer it first yourself. In the interview? Nope. Or just what Before you Before you say. do the interview, as, you've, as you create the list and you get it all ready to go, write down your own answer to the question because you're looking for someone who's going to do something similar to you. So, right, we talked about this before. Yeah. So if we, if we answer the questions ourselves, now we know what we're looking for in the answer. That might just be brilliant. <laughs> that's why you get paid the big bucks to do what you do. Right? So that's, that's something that, that I tell all my clients to do. Ask the questions yourself. I had, I had a different client I was talking to today who asked me if I would do skills testing for, a, for candidates. I said, absolutely. I said, but my requirement for doing that is that you do them too. And they, they kind of was like, what? Why would I do that? And I said, because what you think is advanced is probably not advanced in the skill that you're looking for. So I need to set your expectations. So you're going to do the, the test so that you know where you land. And if you felt you were advanced and you're at um, an intermediate level, well, then now you know you don't need advanced level skills, right? I had one client who begged begged not to do it and I let them do it. They wanted advanced level skills and I went and I found them the most advanced level skilled person that I could possibly find for them and they're like, whoa, wait a minute, we don't need this. <laughs> like, see, this is why I told you to do the test, <laughs> right? So we had to start all over again. So it doesn't matter what it is, what kind of benchmark you have in the questions or the, the skills test or whatever it is you're doing, do it yourself first. Or if you're replacing or um, having an employee to, to add to the business and you've already got employees, have them do it. Because you can see their work, you know what their work is like. And so you have them do it so you can benchmark it against them. Not an idea, an actual physical person that you know what their skill level is. 
No, it leads me to a side question that we don't need to spend a lot of time on, but I wouldn't want an organization full of people exactly like me. No, right? you don't. I don't want someone who's going to respond in exactly the same way as me or have exactly the same thought pattern and perspective. Right. So how do we fit that into the mix? But as the company grows, initially you will want that, right? You will want to have people who are going to respond in a similar way because you're building the business, you're building a reputation. But eventually there will come a time where you need to have people that handle things in different ways. And so um, it's about, actually it's funny, I had one client tell me they wanted to hire an operations manager. And I said, okay, so let's talk about that. And he said, well, I just want to hire someone just like me. And I said, well, why would you want to do that? And he says, well, because then they'll do all the things that I want them to do. And I said, but do you do all the things you want to do, you want done? Well, no, I don't want to do that. That's why I want to hire someone else. Why do you think that person's going to want to do all the same <laughs> things as you? You need someone opposite you who's going to do the things you want done that you don't want to do, right? That's why the first one that I said is you hire someone who does the things you don't want to do, right? That very first employee is taking all the things that you as an employer, a business owner, don't want to do. They're taking that off your plate, right? They become the yin and yang almost, right? They become the complement mm -hmm. of what you are, right? Because they handle things that you don't want to do. Man, mind blown again. Oh, okay. Well, Shelly, you've had a, covered a lot of things today and I don't know about everyone else who's listening, but I know that I've learned a lot. What have we, what are, what's left? What, what key? principles, ideas, concepts, um, advice have we not covered? Like what, what would be important to make sure we don't forget to mention today? I think one thing that I, I would like to mention, and, and mostly because I hear this all the time, okay, um, is that I have an employer come to me and say, okay, look, I need to hire someone. I want to hire a part-time. And, and, and this, let's get past the point of, part-time, virtual assistant, whatever, we're at the part-time stage. I want to hire someone part-time. And I want, you know, eventually I want to grow that position six months down the road. I want that person to be full-time. And I stop them right then and there because, again, you need to remember what it is you're looking for when you're hiring in any scenario. So, like I talked about the blinders on for the skills and all of that. Um, you want to make sure if you only have time if you only have the ability to hire a part-time person now, you want to hire someone who wants to do part-time work and they will have a reason for that, okay? They either have, maybe they have a family at home and they only want to work between the hours of 10 and 3 or whatever their reasons are for part-time. Those don't disappear in six months, okay? So six months from now, when you say you're ready to, ha to have that person as a full-time person, that person's either going to leave um, or you're going to have to accommodate them to be part-time, right? And so um, you look at it and you say, okay, I'm going to hire someone part-time. This is the role. And then when you get to a point where that person's working their 20 hours and they're not getting everything done, whatever the hours are, and they're not getting everything done that needs to be done because you've gotten so much busier, then you look at hiring another part-time person because you can't grow that person into full-time, right? But what that does for you, that what, a, what that allows the business to do is to continue to grow but also have some backup, right? If employee A has a sick kid at home and can't come into work, well, maybe employee B can come in a couple hours early and still cover some stuff. Or maybe employee B wants to go on a two-week vacation this summer with her kids somewhere down in the States, and employee A can cover that for you, right? So you give yourself more options when you do something that way. But you have to remember, part-time is part-time. You're not gonna get someone who wants full-time in six months. And if you hire that person who wants full-time now, but they're only gonna take part-time for you right now, well, they've pulled the wool over your eyes and you're gonna be replacing them in two months because they're still looking for that full-time job. Mm -hmm. So just remember what it is you're looking for and make sure you stay true to that. Some great advice. Um, now, 
I'm assuming and I'm hoping even, and I know that's not why you came on the podcast, but it would be nice if, you know, your your particular um, firm and your business grew from uh, people being aware of why they might need to hire an HR consultant. Am I using the right title? Is that what you yes. would call yourself? Mm -hmm. Okay. So t tell everyone listening, how, how would they go about engaging your services? What does that look like? High level, like just how do they get a hold of you? What is that process like? Well, I mean, everything starts with just a consultation. And sometimes it's a very simple question that needs to be answered. Um, and sometimes it's it's much more complicated than that. Than that. Um, for me, a consultation allows me to guide you in the right direction, um, whether that be utilizing my services and talking about the different things that I can do to help you. Um, or it could mean that I am referring you off to someone else who can do it better than me or that needs to do it. Um, you know, so as a new as a new employer, and when I say that as a business owner who's looking to hire employees, there are some things you need to have in place or you really should have in place. Um, and yes, it's going to cost you a little bit of money, but the very first one besides the job description, which is your guiding light for everything you do, is employment contracts. Now you can do that with a, an HR consultant, myself or any other one should be able to do that. Um, you can do that with an employment lawyer um, or a, a business lawyer, whichever term you want to use. Uh, but that's the very first thing. It, it really all boils down to just a consultation because everyone's going to need something different, whether it's help with recruiting, um, which I can do. I've done it for 30 years, so it's pretty simple for me to, <laughs> to get in there and build a job description and get that going for you. Um, or it could be uh, employee handbooks, it could be helping with team engagement, whatever the issue is and whatever stage your business is in, um, an HR consultant can help you determine what the next step is and make sure that you're abiding by the legal regulations you have to in your, in your jurisdiction, wherever that may be, if it's Alberta, if it's Ohio or wherever across North America, there are different regulations in every jurisdiction, but understanding what those are, that's where the HR consultant is really valuable because they can guide you in a way that protects the business and helps you achieve your goals. Okay, so how do, how do these people get a hold of you specifically? What are the best ways to reach you? The best way to reach me is through my website at uh, www.hiregrowthconsulting.com and that's H-I-R-E growthconsulting.com um, and they can submit a, a form to request a meeting or they can actually just book a 30-minute consultation with me right there. And is it safe to say even pre-COVID but especially now geographic area is not really relevant? Geographic area really wasn't relevant before COVID but it's just that much easier to do it now because it's a much more widely accepted way of doing business. Um, but yeah, it could be anywhere. Um, I work with clients in, in the U.S. and I work with clients all across Canada. Now, I didn't prep you for this, so hopefully I'm not diving into something that is I'm misinformed on. But if I remember right, Shelly is passionate about this stuff that she is in some various stage of launching, like, was it do-it-yourself courses or something? Yeah, so I do have um, some um, some courses available right now that help uh, business owners do it. I have found, though, that they just don't have the time to do it, yeah. right? So that may not be available for much longer. <laughs> um, I may be, I'm, I'm looking at possibly repurposing that into a different um, different way for my business, but regardless... There are tools out there that can help any business owner, and whether it's the tools that I have and can and can give you, um, you just be careful of pulling tools off the internet because they may not be relevant for wherever you are in the world. Okay. Well, and on that note, actually, a while ago, I almost forgot I wrote it down. I wrote down this prompt to make sure I mention. Feel free to add on if you want to comment on this, but. Um, with the growth of AI and specific things like chat GPT and stuff, oh, I don't need an HR consultant. I don't need a lawyer. I can just type in what I need and Google or chat GPT or fill in the blank, whatever will give me everything I need. How reliable, unreliable is that approach? You know, it's a fantastic tool to start 
Um, and I don't know enough about AI. I haven't really delved that much into it. I use chat GTP, GPT, whichever it is. I always get that wrong. Um, I utilize that in my business too to help me with things. Uh, but it's always a starting point. It's never the finished product. Um, and when it comes to things such as legal documents, I wouldn't go there at all. Um, you, Because you never know what's going to be in there that could hurt you, right? So yes, it's a tool. Yes, you can use it. Yes, um, there's fantastic things that it can do. Um, but it can't do everything. So know its limitations and like exactly. you said, sort of use it as a starting point, a springboard. Mm -hmm. So as we wrap up today, um, I want to thank you for joining us. I want, um, I've, again, I don't know, I can't speak for anyone else, but I've learned a lot. If it wasn't going to make so much noise, I've taken a lot of <laughs> mental notes. I would have been writing a lot of physical notes here. Now, I always want to make sure we end our podcast, and I think it's generally been that way already, but on a uplifting, encouraging note. So what kind of closing comments um, would you want to leave with the people listening to sort of help them go away from here feeling excited and um, confident and encouraged by like next steps? It's, it's interesting because I find a lot of clients come to me in crisis. Um, with something drastic going on in their business. And, and I just, I, I guess I want to say that there's a solution and there is a way out of whatever the situation is. Um, it may not always be the most convenient or the least expensive, but there is always a way out. There is always something to make it better. And so the longer you wait, the harder it gets. So just embrace what's going on, figure out where to go to get the help you need. And at the end of the day, you will feel lighter about what's going on in the business because now you have the help that you need. So it's, you know, it's, it's you know, bite the bullet and just, just do it. Get the help because there is, um, there are a lot of things that can really hurt you in business, but there are a lot of ways and a lot of things you can do to make it so much easier to run a business and feel the satisfaction of what you've built in your life. Well said. Maybe on that note, I'll just add in my own one comment I've been thinking about. And this might be a weird way to think about it, but I kind of, I've started to appreciate this. So we can we talk about employees being the most valuable asset? And sort of I was thinking in my own life about what motivates me to want to come to work. Well, I love what I do. So the revenue generating activity of my business, I enjoy, but I kind of really enjoy the opportunity to give someone else meaningful employment. And I know that might seem like kind of like sappy and corny and whatever, but when I have eight, 10 people coming to work on a regular basis who are getting good pay, but more importantly, they're enjoying coming to work. They have an environment they look forward to going to. They tell other people enough to tell the people while they work and they're excited about it. There's some kind of intrinsic reward that I can't really explain that I'm finding myself enjoying as part of hiring people as providing that wonderful up place for them to be that mm -hmm. wonderful place for them to work. I don't know if that makes Mike the corniest person in the world, but for some reason, that's just, I'm really coming to appreciate that side of being an, an employer. So. And I think there's a lot of people that that would resonate with, um, especially when you think about geographically where we're located and the fact that 80% of businesses in Alberta are small businesses. That is something that I think a lot of people will identify in themselves. I mean, being able to provide a lifestyle for someone else, that's, a, that's no small feat. I mean, that's a lot of hard work and effort and, and people need to be proud of that, right? It's it's a way of life. And, and for someone who is an entrepreneur, that really probably is a driving factor for all of us, right? Knowing that we're making a difference in someone's life. Yeah, not just our customers, but our employees, because mm -hmm. we should be treating them both the same. Absolutely. Well, I want to thank Shelly for joining us here today on the Business Speak podcast. Again, I can't speak for all you listening, but I have learned a ton, and I think we've been well taught and edified 
I would encourage you to reach out to Shelly. As she said, she, you can find her at her website, higergrowthconsulting.com. It is .com, right? It is. All right. Uh, so please check out her website and reach out to her for uh, ideas and thoughts and maybe even just to say thank you for sharing some of her wonderful insights today. Again, you've been listening to the Business Speak podcast. I'm your host, Mr. Chill. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Have a fantastic day. You've been listening to the Business Speak podcast featuring Mr. Chill. Be sure to subscribe and add us to your podcast library to ensure you never miss an episode. We love hearing from our listeners. If you have a topic or question you'd like us to discuss, would like to be a guest on our show, or would otherwise like to get in touch with us, please visit our website at businessspeak.ca. Thanks for listening to Business Speak, the language of business simplified simplified